Um, this presentation is purposely short and sweet, and Carol will put on the recording if she hasn't done so already, um, and um, away we go. So we're going to talk about safety instrumentation, a very important topic. It's become quite mature now, and um, we've got a large collection of people here, and also um, we've got about 200 that want the recording, so it's a good turnout. Um, so effectively, what I'm going to do in this 25 minutes, 20 to 25 minutes, is quickly go through the reasons for safety integrity levels, briefly talk about the 61158 standard and the 61511 standard, the IEC standards, just briefly talk about those and then um, look at some of the uh, sort of typical suggestions. So we do these courses every um, week. We do a recording or a live session. So the live sessions are good because it means you can interact with me. Um, and obviously, uh, we can probably go further. So just to put the sort of framework as to where we are at the moment um, <coughs> in the world with safety, um, I just wanted to look at some typical nasty events, some very, very horrible accidents that occurred, um, as Blackadder says, horrible, um, and obviously just look at some of the why we need safety integrity levels and why we need to stand it. So basically, can you think of England? Presumably most of you have been to England. Uh, Humberside is fairly north, further north, as I said, 1974. Teacups were tinkling and the kettles whistling. Next moment, a big explosion. Mills has got some questions there if you don't mind answering. So in Fixborough, 1974, massive explosion and um, caused by temporary faulting design by poorly qualified design team. So bad training, bad design team, poor uh, piping, which was put in a temporary fashion, and of course you had a cyclone, cyclohexane methane cloud, and of course, last screw into 15 tons of TNT. TNT. So, um, 28 killed. So, obviously, very bad situation. Uh, another one in Italy, Cervezo. Can you please all confirm that you can see the slides up there? Um, I just want to put a text there. Can you see the slides, all of you? Just bring it up. Putting it out there, as my voice says. Um, so there we have TCP. You're all probably familiar with TP, TCP. It's a disinfectant. Oh, good. Oh, great. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> oh, good. Some guys, by the way, have problems with the slides. Oh, good. Thank you very much. Some people have problems with the slides if they've got the wrong browser version. So TCP is another thing, it's disinfectant. And exothermic reaction, can anyone tell me what an exothermic reaction is? Very bad reaction, but what's an exothermic reaction? Can anyone tell me? Carol, over to you. What is an exothermic reaction? But I'm thinking by the fact that it's got thermic in it, it's something to do with heat. Carol, you're extremely wise and uh, knowledgeable. Exactly. As Carol says, heat and exo means out of. So it means heat is released from the reaction. And of course, if heat's released from the reaction, you can imagine what happens. And uh, obviously, the last thing in your mind is uh, heat reaction. Heat is released, and of course, 41 barrels containing toxic residues go missing and found incinerated, but basically, massive explosions. So, again, big problem. So what are the what are the issues here? Um, management failure, and obviously um, lack of control with the um, issue. Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania, 79. Number two reactor, no deaths or injuries, but I can promise you with the release of um, of radioactive um, material, um, we may have a lot of unexplained deaths or horrible diseases due to cancer. So that was due to inadequate control room instrumentation, poor emergency response. So 
So this is where the term cognitive overload. Can anyone tell me what cognitive overload is? Um, any suggestions there from Bilal, Sebe, Alexandra, Kirill, Sokol, and um, Zishan? Any suggestions there, guys? What is cognitive overload? Please tell me. Any suggestions? I'll leave the microphone over to you. I think everyone's a bit cautious, but just text it in the box. Cognitive overload means you've got a ferocious amount of information pouring out at the operator, and the operator just can't cope. So there may be something happening on his SCADA or his distributed control screen, but he's so overloaded with information, he doesn't see there's a problem occurring. So obviously, you can't just bombard the operator with tons of information. You've got to make sure he's trained or she's trained, and there's a reasonable amount of information, so very important. So another, another accident here in Bhopal, which you're all probably familiar with, some nasty jokes about Bhopal, um, but basically dangerous chemical reaction, a horrendous situation occurred, another exothermic reaction, which means releasing of heat, and 40 tons of methyl cyanide, cyanate, which is obviously related to cyanide, which is a killer. Spread two hours, eight kilometers downwind, and 900,000 inhabitants um, were exposed to this. 4,000 people died, 10,000, 11,000 disabled. Absolutely horrendous situation. What was the cause? Well, again, lots of disabled systems, as they were, safety systems were disabled, obviously to try and improve production, and there were management failures in even uh, running the plant. Milford Haven, Texaco Refinery, well, we've probably canvassed that along. In fact, we ran a training course a few months before then, actually, oddly enough. Um, and again, operators uh, lacked information on which to make decisions. And again, there's a bit of alarm overload, or we could probably say also cognitive overload. Alarm overload means lots of alarms occurring, so many alarms occurring, the poor operator doesn't know what to do. So, of course, uh, the operator is not able to take corrective action. So again, you can see what I'm driving at here. Lots of problems which could have been avoided. Another problem here in El Paso, um, mal operation of the plant and bad operation of the plant, no plant operating procedures, inadequate vessel relief devices, and obviously, and also no analysis of what could go wrong in the original plant design. So you remember things such as pr process hazard analysis. You try and look at all things that could go wrong. You sometimes hear the word hazards. Hazard, very important. So very important in the design process. BP refinery, but more recent. Um, uh, explosions uh, there and um, killed 15 people. Again, these things are very bad. BP refinery can't possibly happen to us. Look at that horrendous situation. So these are all saying we need some sort of protection. We need some system in which to do our design and make sure the plant is protected. And it doesn't necessarily mean just a simple um, oil and gas plant or chemical plant. It refers to anything. Now this presentation is focusing on process safety. There's another whole ball game out there which is machinery safety, which I'm not going to spend too much time on. I'm focusing on process safety, which is processes as opposed to batch um, machinery, um, for example, um, things you hear about uh, machine tools, uh, safety curtains, discrete um, items. So I'm not so interested there. I'm just really focusing on the uh, process safety. So a few terms that we're using here. First of all, safety instrumented system, SIS. And this could be anything such as trip system, shutdown system, instrumented protection system, IPS. So the term I'm going to use in this presentation is SIS, safety instrumented system. Is that clear to everyone? I hope it is. So a safety instrument system is often what we refer to as a functional safety system. So another term that you will hear used. And basically, as you would imagine, safety depends on the correct functions being performed. So functional safety means something is protecting the operators and the plant from severe damage. And functional safety 
is um, the term used, which is part of the overall safety, uh, which relates to the correct functioning of the safety instrument system and other protection layers. So really, functional safety is about providing safe operation to the plant, very important. So just bear in mind that term SIS I use here, safety instrument system, SIS. Um, so typically, just back off for one second and say, what is a typical component of a control loop? Now, this is a very basic discussion. I'm not trying to make it any advanced. I'm trying to make it as simple and as understandable as possible. So forgive me for being simplistic, but here's typical hardware components of a control loop. What do we normally have? The PLC, input device. So here's your information coming in. And here's your output device, the valve control. So you've got control there, and obviously, uh, implied is that you've got a set point from the operator or engineer or whatever. So information coming in and decision made here by the PLC controller and control going on there. And that's for a typical flow loop. So that's pretty simple. Obviously what's missing here is any mention of the word safety. So we need to fix that. So. This is where safety controls comes in. So basically, you've got your control system here, the DCS, distributed control system, or PLC, operating equipment, and then you've got your safety instrumented system here, the protection system, which operates to protect the plant from failure. Can you see that it is distinct, distinct from the control system? Very really important. So scope of a safety instrument system, obviously from the sensor, logic solver to the actuator. So the idea is to give you 100% protection. So here's a typical definition of a safety system, sensors, logic solver, and actuator, like a valve, for example. So you've got three subsystems. Each subsystem here must meet a particular target value, which we'll talk about now, saw target value. So whether it's the um, control, the basic solver, the sensors, or indeed the actuators, each must meet a sole target. So just to go through a few uh, basics here, to give some of the blotches on the screen, it's designed to catch your attention. Obviously, the whole idea of the safety measures is to reduce the risk of harm to people, equipment, and assets. Assets are basically equipment. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Uh, Carol, can you just text to Zishan, who Ma Yun, and say, we will give him a copy of the recording, and please don't waste his time sitting in here. So just say I apologize for that, if you don't mind, Carol. While we, um, I think it's to do with the browser that he's using. Now, risk are due to hazards, so let's have a look at the hazards. And obviously a hazard is a basically a built-in physical characteristic which could cause um, uh, harm to you uh, as a person or your equipment or property. So obviously that's what we're interested in. So hazard and a risk. So hazard is the physical or chemical characteristic which could cause harm. A risk is the other definition term which we've got to understand, very important. It's a combination of severity and probability of the risk. So for example, severity is how bad is the risk and the probability is how likely is it to occur? So if you're standing on a balcony looking out to the, um, out of your house, and you're standing on the balcony, if you fall, the severity is that you will kill yourself. The probability of your balcony collapsing, as long as it's not wood, is very, very low. So you could say, look, the probability of the balcony collapsing is once every 100 years. Well then you know, the, the risk is fairly low so, because you take probability and you multiply it by risk. So very important. So here's a typical simple safety system here. Denko man, we've got you putting your hand up. Can I help you at all? There's a question there. Uh, no, I thought he was chatting.
Hello, Carol, can you hear me? Just text. I think Denko is having some problems. Hello, can you hear me now, Carol? Yes, I can hear you again, Steve. That's good. Good to have you back. Sorry, I cut you off there. Okay, um, we're just now on to the um, simple shutdown system. Uh, Emil seemed to have, uh, Emil, our guru, is having a look here. Um, um, but basically, we're looking at a simple shutdown system now. Here's a typical vapor hazard, and um, sorry, Emil, over to you. Yeah. Uh, okay. Look, um, hopefully everyone can hear me. Can you put your hands up if you can hear me, guys? Everyone, just put your hands up. Over to you. Just put your hands up. Thanks very much, guys. Okay, fantastic. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I'm sorry about the um, site uh, drop out there. I think it's my wireless connection. Hopefully not Carol's power in uh, London office. Um, so basically we've got a simple shutdown system here. Just to recap, um, I'm just really looking at risk and hazards, and then I obviously want to go on to talk about SIL. So simple shutdown system here. As you can see, we're looking at level and... Um, Level control and obviously valve and very simple overflow hazard here. So obviously the idea here is to avoid having overflow, otherwise you'd have a hazard. Um, here's another simple shutdown system here. Uh, uh, okay, good on you, Carol. Sorry, must be me. Uh, here we've got a uh, system with um, fails closed on loss of air pressure. And again, um, a little simple shutdown system here. Uh, as we just as we describe here now um, obviously there's multiple uh, stage plant trip and an emergency shutdown system two stages stage one and stage two um, and I just want to really spend a few seconds talking about risk reduction so really the idea with risk reduction is <clears throat> um, you could have uh, three levels of risk high low moderate and obviously, um, you could say the idea is of risk is the frequency of the event, probability of it happening, times by the consequence. So, for example, um, you could have uh, one in ten years is a frequency, uh, and the severity could be five people hurt. So, obviously. Um, the qualitative side is high, low, moderate. You try and avoid. You want to try and go for a quantitative um, numbers. We all, we as engineers, we deal with numbers, so that's really important. 
So the risk is um, the frequency of the event times the consequence. So risk could be um, you could have fatal, serious injury, or minor injury. So that's the consequence. The frequency is how often does it occur? Does it occur once a year, once in 10 years, once a million years? Can't hear or see anything in Bangkok. Gary, um, Emil, do you mind just or uh, just checking what? Um, yeah, thanks. I'll send you a copy of the recording and slides. So obviously, the whole idea to reduce risk is to reduce the frequency or the consequences. So the idea is that with risk, you want to try and move everything down to that level there. Um, you want to try and reduce the frequency to as low as possible. So sorry. So the consequences are um, minor injury over here, serious injury or fatal, and the idea is you want to try and reduce the consequences and the frequency as low as possible. So that's the idea. So risk reduction, first of all, you identify the hazard, work out the uh, risk, look at the risk reduction requirements, and then you go around until you actually reduce the risk to a target value. So that's really important. So safety control systems obviously act independently of the process. Why do we have them acting independently of the process? Well, the idea is to prevent you with your PLC making a mistake in the programming, and of course, that could cause a diabolical failure. So the whole idea with a, is to try and ensure that your safety control systems are completely uh, independent of the process of the control system, or the PLC, or the distributed control system. It's really important. Um, so the idea is that we then reduce uh, the risk reduction by reducing the frequency of the hazardous area. So the whole idea is we try and reduce the likelihood or the chance or the probability of it occurring. That's really important. And the amount of the risk reduced is called the risk reduction factor. So the risk reduction allocated is uh, determines its target safety integrity level. So target safety level, or SIL, you often hear used. So there's different safety integrity levels, and the ones that you'll hear referred to are 4, 3, 2, 1, safety integrity levels. Um, sorry, Sok, Sok and Lingham, you too fast. Okay, I'm sorry, I'll slow down. I'm sorry about that. Um, so the safety, you will get a full recording, Sok and Lingham. It's just that people um, don't want to hang around here forever listening to me, so I tend to go quite fast, but you will get the full recording and the slides. So the idea with safety integrity levels is um, is really to reduce the, the risk. So basically here we've got uh, the SIL, one, two, three, four, um, and the probability of failure on demand can range between 10 to the minus four, less than 10 to the minus four, greater than 10 to the minus five. So the idea is that you try and give the degree of confidence in the ability of the system to provide functional safety. So it doesn't necessarily mean you have to provide a 4 or a 1. You need to look at the actual particular application that you're dealing with. So a typical example is what I use here. Let's take a typical example intuitively. Let's look at a soul of 1. So the 1 is um, between 10 and 100, less than 100, required reduction factor, or 10 to the minus 2, greater than 10 to the minus 2, less than 10 to the minus 1. So 10 to the minus 1 is 1 tenth, and greater than 100 is the probability of failure on demand. So it's between 100 and a tenth. So here we've got a safety um, system with availability of 90. So you've got a availability of 90% is acceptable. So in other words, you've got a, for example, high level trip. So availability of 90% means that you've got a 10% chance of failure. 10% chance of failure. That means one out of every 10 times the high level is reached, there will be a failure for whatever reason. Maybe the high level doesn't detect it. 
That means you could have a f ov overflow one out of ten times. That's a sill of one. So if that's not acceptable, you obviously need to look at alternative sills, one, or, uh, two, or three, or four. So this is a very low um, integrity level, but it may be adequate. You may say, look, it's water that's flowing out of the tank, so I don't particularly care. But it may be something critical. Uh, if it's something critical, then this would obviously be unacceptable. So the point made is that you select a particular soil level for your application, a safety integrity level. So very important that you uh, look carefully at your application and then make sure that you have the right safety integrity level. Uh, yeah, look, I'm just, uh, Carol, if you can just tell Anine Chucks not to worry, we'll send him a recording. It's probably no, or her recording. There's no point hanging around. So that's uh, intuitively what soil means. So very important with all this that you do look at your uh, risk reduction factor. And as I said, the safety integrity system achieves a risk reduction by reducing the frequency of the hazardous area. So we try and reduce the probability that it will occur. So that's really important. And it is isolated from your control system. Very important to, to, to pick that up. Um, and then the other a few little points, obviously, is uh, a suggestion here on the design principles. And as I said, the risk is actually the frequency of the event and the consequence. So this is what we're looking at now, is the frequency of the event. So the safety uh, system is trying to reduce the frequency of occurrence. So very important to pick that up. But we will provide all these slides to you, so don't worry, I mean chucks, they will be provided, uh, although you obviously can't hear me. So just bear in mind also that the protection system is completely uh, uh, different to the actual control system. It's quite important to, to realize that. Okay, I think, um, as I said, that's just a quick uh, rundown on uh, safety integrity system on SILs. Um, and um, that brings us to the close of this little presentation. Um, any questions or comments from anyone? Any questions from you, Carol? No, I haven't. Uh, I haven't got any uh, any questions today, Steve. Has any, anybody else got any questions? You can put them in the. Ah, uh, oh, Socklingham's got one. I'll pass it back to you, Steve. Okay. What you do, uh, Socklingham, is um, I'll, what I'm going to do is um, there's obviously some interest here. I'm going to send you the chapter as a very good write-up on the. Uh, soil level determination. I'll send you that, but obviously you need to look at the particular application. Um, I mean, if it's a fairly uh, low risk application, you're not too worried, but if it's obviously high risk, you're dealing with um, an exothermic reaction or something critical, you'd obviously have a higher soil level. So you'd look at the uh, charts for that particular application. But what I'm going to do is Carol will send out tomorrow a write-up on the um, different uh, on the soil actual calculations and uh, give you an idea there. Um, unfortunately, I don't have um, too much time. This is just basically a quick introduction. But thanks for logging in. And if you have any questions, just drop me an email uh, if, you, if the um, write-up doesn't explain that. Thanks. Apologize for not being more um, giving an hour presentation, but we found that people get a little bit um, irritated when they've had too many of uh, the presentations too long. But we will send it out. And if you have a question, just drop me a note uh, at tech at idc-online.com, and I'll be very de delighted to give you any more information if that little uh, write-up doesn't help you.
which I'll, we'll send out to Carol will be sending out tomorrow. Carol Addison. Thank you very, very much for listening in anyway. Back. Thanks, Steve. Uh, glad that uh, uh, your connection uh, came back very quickly um, so we were able to complete the session. Um, Apologise to anybody who has had uh, sound problems today. We are dealing with uh, cutting edge technology here so um, it, uh, it does uh, require some tweaking occasionally. Um, we hope you enjoyed the session and thank you very much uh, once again Steve. And uh, as uh, Steve said, we'll be sending out the, uh, a copy of the recording and the slides and also the, uh, the uh, relevant chapter of, uh, of one of our books. Uh, we hope to see you in future sessions. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Bye.